So I'd like to welcome you to Pietro's Ranieri Agency podcast number 10. Um, in this series of podcasts, I'm trying to get an inside track into how the coronavirus is affecting businesses globally. And today I'm pleased to have one of our Chinese-based clients to tell us a bit about what's going, there, going on there, although he's actually from Birmingham. So I'm pleased to welcome Jamie O'Callaghan, who is Global Head of Sales and Marketing for IAG, IAG Group um, International Hi-Fi Division. So Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I think um, before we sort of jump into the podcast, I think I need to sort of publicly congratulate you on your new addition to the family. So you say it was three months old now, the baby? Three months next week. Yes, thank you. Yeah, little bundle of joy. How are you coping? Is the baby sleeping? You know, he's, he's sleeping fantastically, thanks to the wonderful device that is the Snoo, that I believe you guys represent. Um, amazing device. Uh, yeah, he's sleeping well. Having a bit of trouble at the minute. I think he's going through growth spurt, but yeah, all good. Coping. Struggling with the sleep, you know. Six and seven hours isn't quite enough for me. I'm a caveman, but it's, uh, no, he's doing good. He's doing good. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed before we uh, obviously pressed record, uh, you said you were at your wife's parents' house during the sort of lockdowns. So I, I did wonder whether that was part of part of you escaping to the parents' house with the baby and like having a bit of help. <laughs> no, no, well, we intended, we, we always intended to have the baby in the UK, um, but it was intended to be a faster turnaround. Um, we we're going to come back and then get back to China as soon as possible. But obviously, situation being situation, we're stuck here for a few months. And yeah, the wife's parents, a lovely big house, nice little space. So happy to put us up for a little while. So very comfortable. But gosh, missing that subtropical climate over there. So yeah. although today's not so bad. Yeah. Well, actually, the whole lockdown, we've had quite nice weather pretty much, you know, as a, as a rule of thumb for the whole of the lockdown. So I do feel for people that are living in sort of in central London, there are quite a lot of guys that work at Ranieri in the UK. They're all in sort of, you know, one bedroom flats, about 14 stories up somewhere. And it's, um, yeah. yeah, but hopefully uh, we'll be out of this soon. So, um, yeah, before we get down to some industry questions, I just wanted to uh, ask you, you know, how your career path up until this point. I mean, obviously, some of the people I interview um, on this podcast, you know, they've kind of come from university, gone to sort of, um, you know, marketing jobs and worked their way up. But you've obviously done the same thing, but you've ended up um, in Shenzhen in China. Um, and I just wondered kind of how, you know, if you could tell us a bit about how, what your career path was up until this point and kind of how you ended up in China. Uh, yeah, well, never intended. Um, it wasn't part of the plan, but I, I, I did a music technology and um, management degree. So um, I've, some of the finest words of advice from my dad was, you know, I, I was banking on being a superstar DJ, a record producer, and it was like, have a fallback son. So I did a 50% management degree, which put me in good stead. Um, I ended up working in retail for uh, DJ retailers, music production retailers, um, for quite a successful one in the UK. Um, one of the biggest independents that sadly run its course. When that went, I had the impetus to, to go into a business with um, a financial backer, business partner who helped me set up a uh, sort of a replacement for that business, a bit of a, um, bit of a self venture, um, which was good. But by, by virtue of his existing business being hi-fi based, I ended up slipping into the world of hi-fi as well as pro audio, DJ music production. Um, and then an old colleague of mine who worked in the pro audio side of things he come across an opportunity in china for iag uh, who i currently work for um i knew the company for years having sell their products and met the, 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 it's a family-owned business so i met the family over the years and various things and by his opportunity he said there's another opportunity opened in hi-fi are you interested where i was in that point of my life it was like yeah we've got things up and running with the business but for me it wasn't actually my passion i didn't enjoy it as much as i thought i would um wasn't really the thing that I wanted to be doing. Um, and he said, come, come fly out to China, have a chat with the family, the IAG group management, see what's on. Um, and then an opportunity came up. So I ended up moving out there to look after the European sales uh, and marketing originally. Uh, that went well, lasted for about two years in Shenzhen. And then I had an opportunity at another company, also based in China, slightly further up north, uh, which was a step up to global management, which was you know, a phenomenal opportunity for me. So I did that. It was great. Stayed in touch with the IAG team, in particular, Michael, the chairman, got a fantastic relationship with him. And literally the minute I left, he was asking me to come back. Uh, it didn't make sense for two years. And then all of a sudden it made sense. And I was missing Shenzhen hugely, being such a, a cosmopolitan and thriving city. He just made me an offer and said, come back, come and run a, you know, the, 
the global operations will do things the way you want to do it and the way it should be done. Um, and then, yeah, ended up back in Shenzhen. So that's six years from the date of, uh, where was it? October will be my sixth, entering my seventh year in China. So this, will, this is the sixth year, I'll be open the seventh year from September onwards. So via retail and opportunity and knowing a few people, it's turned into a full-time sort of immigration and career path, which is good. Yeah, and you think you'll stay there then? Is that your, you, you're set to stay in China now? Do you know what? I, I, my girlfriend at the time when we moved out there, we planned to do 12 months. I literally kept everything in my mom's loft, ready to move home, kept my property in the UK and that. Um, and we planned on being 12 months. 12 months turns two years, two years, three, four, five, six. Now, now it really does feel like home. So um, whether it will be permanent, who knows? Obviously, it's career determined because you can never become a naturalised citizen. So it's not like, you know, do three years in an EU country and stay. It'll never be that case. It'll always be work-based. But as long as the opportunities stand on the career path for both she and I, um, I mean, she's forged a wonderful career out there herself. So as long as that remains, there's, it remains our home for the foreseeable future. And, you know, the lifestyle it offers, the, the benefits. I mean, people have a picture of Shenzhen. And obviously, I know when you came out and saw us uh, sometime last year, you saw the different side of the city, which is the wonderful cosmopolitan side. Lifestyle, you know, culture, everything, it's good. So there's no plans to come home yet. Who knows whether it's forever, but, you know, it's, um, it's, it's definitely home for now with the foreseeable. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I do get it. I, um, I mean, as you know, I travel to um, Hong Kong quite a lot. Um, or did did until the lockdown um, yeah. and I've always really liked Hong Kong I just love the whole kind of energy of the place just I don't know there's something kind of very special about you know the place and you can kind of see why these expats sort of like it there the one thing that I was really shocked about um, was I don't know as a as a, an English guy you sort of have this impression of China and what it would be like and you kind of I don't know you just, maybe I don't know whether it's the media or just the way that kind of it's built up but then when you took me around Shenzhen, I was generally, I was blown away. It was such an amazing city. Um, yeah. You know, it was a modern city. Everything was clean. Everything was kind of, you know, everyone was just seemed like very happy, very, like I say, the, very cosmopolitan. There was a pink Rolls Royce driving around, which was the local TV star, I think it was. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the infrastructure, I mean, everything was, it was amazing. I was, I, you know, I get it. But, you know, as an English guy in China, I mean, do you feel like a bit of an outsider or I mean because again when I sort of travel there Hong Kong's not so bad because it's obviously quite you know English in that sense but when you go when I went when you go into China you do feel like an outsider um but I guess when you live there you get to know the place and you know it's but do you I mean do they do you have lots of sort of Chinese friends you kind of you know you sort of, you know what I mean yeah it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, when, when I first met, uh, first out there, everything felt insanely foreign, as it does. You know, there's very little English. Even in Shenzhen, though, it's more cosmopolitan, but you stray away from the main drags. It is, there is very little English. Um, it is a little bit isolating, but there's a good community of expats in Shenzhen. You know, there's many, many thousands of, of expats, mainly teacher-based, but there are professionals. Um, but there, there is a lot of English in terms of Chinese colleagues and things. So you do tend to become numb to it. And when we did move out there, we did, we lived like real submersed into um, more around where our office was, where you came to visit. So way out from the city centre. So it was kind of like a 100% immersion. Um, so you had to get used to it quick. Um, so we are now probably quite numb to that. And the good thing about that is nowhere, in the, nowhere else in the world feels foreign, you know, so it can step off a plane everywhere, feels slightly less foreign than China, even like Vietnam or whatever. The only place that compares is probably Moscow, because obviously the, the language and the, the, the yeah. written, um, written English is also small. But it isn't that isolating, you know, that you can get by. Translation apps are a wonderful life-saving tool. And, you know, the other thing is it's a massive adventure. That's the other thing. If you've got that sense of adventure and things like that, are just they're, they're minor. You can get by. Um, and, yeah, we, we don't find it too bad at all. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, like you say, with the translation apps and stuff, I mean, it, like Moscow is probably equivalent where you sort of look around and you just cannot understand a single thing. You can sort of see that a restaurant is a restaurant because there's food there. It's like, yeah. I remember going into Moscow once, um, I've only been to Moscow once, and um, we went, we were looking for a restaurant, just sort of walking down the main street, and we literally just were looking at these shops thinking, don't, I have no idea what these places are. And we went into one place thinking it was a restaurant. It turned out to be a bookie's. I don't know. There were little tables. We thought it was a cafe. People were drinking stuff, but it was actually a bookies. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, cool. Well, look, um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely jealous. I mean, I, you know, and 
if I did my life over again, I always felt that, you know, maybe I could go to, um, you know, certainly Hong Kong was the first I get. China, China might be another step further. I mean, I've got a friend who um, I used to play rugby with when I was at school. He's now moved his family to Singapore and they love it. I mean, they, you know, they've been there a long time now. And again, it's a different thing. Singapore is a completely different place to like Hong Kong, like it is to China, but it's that whole kind of expat, you know, warm, sort of adventurous lifestyle. I kind of quite, you know, I'm, it's very, I find it very appealing. So but anyway, um, so look, um, just for the benefit of uh, the people watching this podcast, do you want to tell us a bit about IAG? Because I know it's got a, a sort of long checkered history and it's um, quite, I mean, when you sort of took me around the campus there in Shenzhen, I, I mean, again, it was another sort of fascinating place. And I just wonder if you want to tell us about um, IAG and then maybe about this campus as well that you took me around as well. Yeah, sure. Well, um, IAG Group, it's a family owned business. Um, obviously, the aspirations to, to extend that to investment, which is something we're going through right now. But it's, it's owned by um, the Chang family, uh, uh, Michael and Bernard, uh, Taiwanese twins um, in their 60s now. They set up manufacturing in um, originally uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong and then moved to China in the 90s. Um, so they were basically a, a very successful loudspeaker and electronics manufacturer for OEM purposes. Um, throughout their success, they acquired a lot of uh, brands, mainly British hi-fi and audio brands that they were OEM manufacturing for. So that includes Wharfdale, Quad, Audio Lab, Mission, Castle, Leak. Um, and basically, they, they acquired a lot of talent, a lot of international talent to develop incredible products um, for these brands. And they invested heavily into manufacturing in China, in Shenzhen, which was, you know, 15 years ago, just a huge manufacturing complex, less cosmopolitan than it is now and more manufacturing led. Um, part of the ambition of the company was to always uh, you know, keep growing, keep growing. So they, they acquired a 1.5 million square foot facility further north in China, where we now do our manufacturing. Um, and the Shenzhen facility, which you came to, to visit, is a huge land a huge space of land in almost central Shenzhen now that is um, it's rented out for you know, third party manufacturers and things like that. But we still keep our HQ there, uh, which is the IAG Country Club, which is a bit of a legendary facility within our industry. It's a bit of a um, bit of a playboy's mansion, I suppose, in, um, in the industrial part of Shenzhen. But really, it's, it's a nice little retreat. You know, it's a, a mountain, a lake, a country club facility, spa, restaurants, um, our R&D, finance, marketing and sales all run from there. Um, and it's quite a nice little office place, to be fair, you know, in working in central China, but actually working in the countryside is quite a perk. Um, so a lovely little place. But we, we own the, all these uh, British brands. We operate in pro audio, um, home audio, and the more consumer side of things. Um, and we, we manufacture literally 95% of everything that goes into our products. So I wouldn't necessarily say we're a tier one manufacturer because we do still use a lot of outsourcing for specialist components. We don't manufacture everything but 95% of what we ship is manufactured within our facility. So it gives us huge advantages as a manufacturer, um, you know, quality control, costing, MOQs, production times. Um, and it allows us to, you know, do what other brands can't do for the price points we do. Um, so, you know, our audio, audio lab brand, our quad brand and our Wharfdale brand, mission brand, are incredible value, highly engineered, over-engineered products in many places with, such competitive advantages and it's uh, it's a tribute to the way IEG has been set up over the years Michael and Bernard very intelligent in um, in, in the way they manufacture and acquire businesses and yeah, yeah. We, we're almost unique in that sense yeah no, I, mean, I mean was um was the whole campus sort of one of the lures in the first place to to go and work for because I suppose if you again as an English guy when you kind of go to China and you're sort of looking for somewhere to settle down in in terms of work and then you know you sort of you get introduced to this whole campus whereas actually you know it felt like a kind of I don't know like an Austrian mountain resort or something which is I mean, I'm trying to explain to the viewers it's so it's such a bizarre place because it's like you're in the middle of an industrial sort of area where everything's very grey and smoky and you just sort of you know it looks like any day it's what you'd kind of expect from a sort of industrial area of China and then you go through the doors of IAG and suddenly you're in, it's like Kellerman's from Dirty Dancing, this kind of like, you know, mountain yeah, sort of free, <laughs> you know, where there's, but it, it feels like, I don't know, like at the moment, like the party's just happened and everyone's just sort of still in a bit of a daze and there's this just lake and restaurant and, you know, I mean, do you tell me that, um, is it Bernard, uh, 
liked the view from the lake where and he wanted to kind of eat there so they built him a little tower with a sort yeah. of a table for two which he can look out over the lake i mean i just find that sort of story incredible it's like it was such a brilliant story yeah i mean it was it, the country club thing was i mean partly bernard and michael that that you know that they are guys who enjoy life um you know they're into their boats they're into their cars um and i think it was part of their lifestyle too but obviously if you want to um acquire and retain talent in China. You've got to offer reasons to live there. Now with Shenzhen and central Shenzhen, that's not so much of a problem, but owning a manufacturing facility right in Futian or Nanshan, it's impossible. You know, you're not even allowed to have manufacturing there anymore. So it's you know, technology and blue chip. So to have people in, in Shenzhen, you need some, somewhere good for them to be, somewhere to keep them entertained. And originally a lot of the engineers would spend like three months on, three months off, three months on, three months off. So while they're there, you've got to look after them and entertain them. And it become a bit of a um, bit of a draw for that. And it, it is, you know, I used to live there when I first moved out there six years ago. We, we lived there for about eighteen months, and it was yeah. good. You know, you live in the jungle. There's a wildlife. There's everything. Yeah, if you go back, um, you know, ten years when you kind of first went there, or even well, I mean, twenty years. You think ten, twenty years, or even ten years ago, Shenzhen was a completely different place. You know, because obviously yeah. a lot of what's there's, what's been built now is all quite new. I think. So if you go back 10, 15, 20 years, you know, having a sort of IAG campus like that, it must have been even more of an oasis back then, because obviously it's not like where we went out to dinner and, you know, we were sat at the bottom of that enormous skyscraper and all that kind of stuff. None of that would have been there at that point. So, you know, that IAG thing, I guess, would have, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a smart thing to do, I guess. You know, it's a very sort of almost like Western idea to, to kind of put in place. Yeah, yeah, and it, it was, you know, it was, it was a sanctuary. Back back then, 15 years ago, there was no means to get into the city centre. The metro didn't exist or things like that. You know, 10 years ago when I went, they didn't even allow the Westerners outside the front gate because, you know, the chances of you wandering off and getting lost were, were quite significant. Um, so it was a self-contained little oasis. And, the, you know, there's a bar there, there's a gym, there's a, like a community. When we first went out there, there were like probably six, six, seven, eight foreigners. So, you know, Friday night you finish work, you go to the bar just like you would in, in London or something. It was cool. Nice little um, self-contained oasis within that um, facility. It does get cabin fever wood kicking, I suppose, which is why a lot of engineers would do three months on, three months off. Not many live there full time like, um, like we did and a few other colleagues. But it is, yeah, it was a treat. It's, it's quite famous within that area, uh, you know, where my wife worked, a lot of people knew of it and used to ask to see photos and things it's a bit of a bit of a party paradise for a, a lot of people in terms of the local mythological understanding of what the country club is but it is you know it's, it's a business place at the end of the day so um it gives you everything you need to for r and r but it's the office as well so it's very functional yeah no amazing so um yeah what's the um what's the state of play in china right now then because um you know obviously i know that there was a quite a, aggressive lockdown to start with but I've heard that hasn't Disneyland opened again in China now? And kind of everyone's starting to get a bit more back to normal. Yeah, well, um, you know, we're still in touch with. I'm still in touch with the office daily, if not, um, you know, more regularly. So they seem to be returning to normal. They were really stringent measures. So right now, I would say they're probably eighty to eighty-five percent back to normal in Shenzhen. You know, life has changed. It's not the same. You know, masks are, are not compulsory, but you know, they're expected. Um, you have to wear them on public transport, uh, but you don't need to wear them when you're walking out and about apparently anymore, although most people do. But life has changed, but it is getting back to normal. So, um, for instance, when they ended lockdown to reopen places of work, you had to have your temperature taken twice a day. You had to put up in um, facilities for immediate isolation of suspect cases. Um, there was a complete log and record of how people were getting to work, how they're getting home from work, what bus they were taking, you know, what trains. So, it, the contact tracing was immediate so it was easy to track how, how people were getting around there are apps in place so if you want to get onto the beach for instance in Shenzhen you have to scan with your app which will confirm you've isolated for two weeks if you're a foreigner or that you're a non um yeah you're non-diagnosed uh, so you're diagnosed of not being a carrier or a, a, a previous sufferer of the disease so with all of these measures in place they're quite strict and stringent in their contact tracing and management of people with the virus or at risk to the virus so they are essentially back to normal apart from this contact tracing methodology they have in place um, and that really gives a lot of security to people within the city and, and why that's not just Shenzhen so things are more or less edging back to normal and tourist attractions are open Disneyland is open as you say um, a lot of the local tourist attractions are open so 
you know, Chinese people can go out and start putting money back into the economy and reclaiming their free time. So all yeah. in all, they're, they're leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of the world as far as we see it. Yeah, so I'm intrigued by, like we were talking before the, um, we started recording, but I'm intrigued as a, you know, again, a Western guy, sort of by the numbers that um, we sort of see from China in terms of like the infections and the deaths and stuff. Because when you look at, you know, much smaller countries like the UK, France and Germany, and their numbers are kind of, through the roof but then china's kind of this like line down at the bottom with like you know south korea or, or wherever it is um you know without knowing all the kind of measures that you were talking about that were in place and how aggressive the lockdown was we were all just sort of here thinking those numbers aren't right but you know what's your opinion on that i mean do you think the chinese are, have only had four thousand dead or is it um what's the what's your opinion yeah, difficult one uh, there's, there's no way, statistically looking at the rest of the world, that, that number just can't be right. It, it can't be. But if you, if you flip it for an instance, just switch the paradigm on that. And, and today I saw on the news, I don't know if it was the BBC or somewhere else, where they're saying if we'd have implemented lockdown a week earlier, we would have had a fifth of the deaths that we had. So China literally initiated lockdown immediately. Like Wuhan was shut down by the end of January. So as soon as they realized case, uh, human to human cases uh, were prevalent, they shut down. They also shut down the rest of China. And they also had the advantage of the Chinese New Year, which meant people weren't traveling. They'd done most of the travel already. So there weren't huge amounts of spreaders. So if you consider from, from that case, if we were saying we'd have done lockdown a week earlier, we'd have had a fifth of the number of cases. What would it have been if we'd have done it three weeks earlier? Because you know we already had the first case in the beginning of February. So if we'd have shut down immediately, would we have had similar low numbers? I mean, it, it does seem unbelievably low, but also are people that distrust in a places like Singapore or Hong Kong and their cases are also incredibly low because of the same measures. Um, you know, we have 1500 people or so within our company. And as far as I'm aware, um, and it would get out through hearsay, we haven't had any cases of COVID-19 within our company. So as a snapshot of Shenzhen, 1500 people out of 18 million, it's not many, but you'd expect statistically, if it was like the UK, there would be some some inference of, or some suggestion. Uh, so it does seem that on a real level, it does seem to be under control and they have controlled it incredibly better than anywhere else in the world. 4,000, <clears throat> finding possible looking at statistics, but how can you prove otherwise? Yeah, so the thing is, I mean, love or hate China with that, whether you know, you're for or against that sort of, sort of system, you know, what it enables um, you know the Chinese to do is like in a situation like this they can lock everything down because when you look at say the UK everyone is complaining about everything you know like we should have locked down earlier we should have you know we should have done this we should have done that but ultimately I don't think half the population is even respecting the lockdown anyway when you look at kind of you know the beaches or people out and about in parks or you know just the general kind of mentality it's you know it's a it's almost like a voluntary lockdown you know, people are massively complaining about it. They're not really doing, I mean, the shops are shut, but people are still out and about. And especially like with the weather, it's not, there's no way that the lockdown is kind of anywhere near as controlled as it could be. Um, but what it's enabled is, you know, this, the virus has spread, like you say, much quicker than it probably should have done. But then you look at, so we disbelieve people like China and their numbers, but the reality is their lockdown is a real lockdown. You know, I didn't realize, for example, that even the supermarkets were shut. And um, one of my other clients who, um, again, based in Shenzhen, he was saying he couldn't even go to the supermarket to get food. Like they were all just sort of living off what they had in the house, which apparently is not a more normal thing to have more food in the house in China anyway. So they could live off that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the UK, I mean, I've been to Tesco's every day. You know, it's not like, you know, we... We, we're only going to Tesco's and places like that, but we're still not really sort of, you know, we go whenever we want. It's not like we're only going for essential food. So, you know, this is the thing. I, I don't agree with the numbers that China put out because I just don't think a country of that size with an epidemic like the pandemic like that could only end up with 4,000 deaths because just by the nature of how many people there are there, you know, that doesn't make sense considering the rest of the world. But I can also see how it could be shut down very quickly. And, you know, they've put the measures in place. And especially that when you're saying about, you know, the temperatures are being taken, the apps monitoring them, because none of that's happening here. I mean, we've been yeah. talking about an app, a contact tracing app for since we started. And I think I, they're trialing it on the Isle of Wight, 
<laughs> it's, like, it's almost laughable. Yeah. You know, so by the time the pandemic's over, the tests from the Isle of Wight will be conclusive. Yes, we should use the contact tracing app. By then, you know, it'll be COVID-20, not COVID-19. So um, it's a self self diagnosis contact tracing app as well currently. So if yeah. if I think oh I've got a sore throat I'm going to activate the app I throw everybody I've been into contact with into lockdown because I've got a sore throat. Whereas in Germany I believe they're using the medical authorization code so you can only activate it if you're diagnosed. Yeah. Um, so that is an official notification. Whereas we're relying on hearsay self diagnosis. But in in China for instance that they've extended that far. When you get on the metro, it tracks you. Obviously, everything in China is paid for by your phone, more or less. You don't use cash anymore. Yeah. Um, you use WeChat Pay. So if I was on Shenzhen Metro and somebody got COVID-19, they would be able to notify me by way of tracking the metro access. So, you know, if somebody goes on there, they, they get the, the disease, that the app will notify them by WeChat. They will know who was on that train at what point and what time, who got off when. So they can notify a whole train of two or 3,000 people that they're at risk of COVID-19 and put them all into compulsory lockdown within hours. Um, we can't do that. They can contain it. We can't, plain and simple. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, say, this is the issue. I mean, this is why I tend to believe the Chinese because uh, certainly with like, the spread and the fact it's all getting back to normal because they are on top of it in this country. I mean, you can imagine like, um, you know, school kids who just want a couple of weeks off. It's like, you know... Yeah. They just like basically say they've got COVID nineteen and all their mates and everyone they've been in contact with will just be off for two weeks. So, yeah. um, sorry, Jamie, one second. Ask Range to set up another link for just the beginning of the podcast. It'll take him two seconds. Yeah. Sorry about that. We've got one Zoom account, um, and it's like it's like a motorway at the moment with people going in and out of it. Yeah. Um, so, Jamie, uh, coming back to um, the business then so how was um covid sort of really affected the business is it um you know manufacturing has that been affected sort of sales i mean what's kind of been the what's been the sort of situation well i mean as soon as we the china side of things was impacted heavily i mean i look after the international so i don't really get involved in the domestic side um we have a separate team um, who look after that so the domestic side of our business literally died overnight in january you know very very quickly things shut off in China, you know, like I said, it was lockdown was lockdown. So they weren't deliveries, they weren't logistics. Um, internationally, things were a little slower to be hit and there was concern at first, but we, we had immediate planning meetings and started, um, you know, just in case, that's the way we started thinking. So we put a lot of policies and procedures in place to make sure that we were preparing for continuous supply of our best selling products, more so than usual, forecasting a little bit further in front. Um, and trying to get ahead of the supply chain. Um, we are also, like I said, responsible for 95% of what we put into our products. So we were able to foresee and, and start to build in advanced components that we knew we would need, which would mean that we didn't have um, logistical issues or, or bottlenecking um, in the anticipation that business was going to drop. However, internationally, I think by the virtues of the wonderful thing called the internet, our sales haven't dropped. Uh, you know, the kind of products we sell are the kind of products people want to enjoy while they're locked in or, or voluntarily locked into their home, which is good for us. So globally, we've actually been fantastic. We were like 20% over target last month um, on a global level, which was incredible. The previous month, we shipped the equivalent of what we would probably normally ship in September or October, peak season shipments, because people wanted the goods to come in. And that was despite places like Spain, or, or places like India having border restrictions on, on imported goods, you know, there's container ships backed up in many areas. Um, and we were still shipping, it was phenomenal. Um, we do think that this is a bit of a, a peak before what we're gonna experience as a, a trough through the summer. Um, we expect naturally that's gonna catch up and there is always a bit of a, with consumer electronics, I think they're always, we're always at the bit of the tail end of what happens. It's like a two to three month kicking when it comes to a recession at least. So we are preparing for that. But as it stands, there isn't any sign that that's happening, um, which is really encouraging for us. Now, that could be down to various things. I mean, one is our, our immediate forward thinking planning. And we put a lot of effort into that, which is a fantastic testament of how we we're set up. I was really, really pleased with the team and how they pulled that together. Um, and obviously the fact that we're not dependent on third party supply chains. So we, we're not on the phone scrambling, trying to get hold of components when we can actually build them ourselves. Um, but also we are hit by the benefit that owning our own manufacturing, we're not in queues. So if you're working with an OEM or a third party ODM or someone, 
yeah. if they're knocked back a month, then everybody's knocked back a month and everyone's fighting. We're not hit by that. So we probably are two to three months ahead of our competition um, in terms of manufacturing. So we can get goods to people quicker uh, without interruption. And we're still developing and launching new products, which a lot of our competition aren't. So, you know, taking it as a positive out of this, but by the way we're set up, we've almost been primed to pounce on such an opportunity. So it's, yeah. it's been good for us. I don't believe the industry as a whole would be like that. There are people suffering. There are UK-based entities or European-based entities that aren't able to operate the same way we are with massive supply chain and logistics issues. So we kind of must have been in there. So hard to say whether the industry or the, um, the market as a whole is up or whether we're having a bigger slice of a small or stable pie. I don't know. But all in all, I think we've put ourselves in an excellent position for this, which is really pleasing. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. I mean, there's definitely, you know, I'm obviously interviewing all sorts of people on this podcast and um, <clears throat> there's definitely lots of pockets of people that are doing very well. I mean, initially, because um, I had a podcast with um, the MD of West Coast here in the UK, the big distribution company, and um, they, they, he was telling me it was like uh, Black Friday every day in their warehouse for about three weeks because they were supplying, yeah. you know, laptops, printers, ink. So everyone working at home, they were also supplying all the Nightingale hospitals with, the, um, with all the IT stuff. Um, then there's all the you know the sort of cloud-based stuff um, and the thing is what's really interesting about this whole situation is it's not like um, you know a normal recession where things have started to slow down and suddenly nobody's got any money you know certainly in the UK I mean it's just like everyone's just been told to stay home so and before that everything was okay and then the government are stepping in with certain things so you know I think there's a lot of people that you know I hate to say this but they're, they're kind of probably as the weather gets better as well, they're sort of enjoying furlough a bit because they're kind of at home. Yeah. They're being paid 80%. And actually, because they're not going out and traveling and all that kind of stuff, they're probably not really losing out financially unless they're sort of, you know, um, if they're on a sort of average salary. Um, so yeah, they're just sort of home and they're still spending stuff. Like I say, they're, you know, they're thinking about their home. I mean, I've kind of upgraded my little home office here. Um, well, I would never have thought about it before because the first thing I do is get on the train in the morning and go to London, just kind of my office yeah. is there. But now I'm having sort of planning around, you know, it's almost like having a hybrid office where I'm here and there. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting, very interesting. So um, moving on to sort of marketing then, I mean, one of the concerns that I had is obviously you've, you've you know, traditionally, you know, throughout the year, <clears throat> many brands, um, they look at things like, you know, E3, EFA, CES, they've got this sort of continual cycle of um, shows and a lot of the kind of marketing that they do around, you know, launching is kind of, you know, geared towards, you know, say launching a range at IFA. Um, now all that's been taken away um, because they can't do any of that. I mean, there's definitely, you know, the shows are still trying to keep their brands alive by doing sort of things virtually and stuff like that, but yet to see if, um, you know, anything, is going to sort of pan out with that. I and mean, you've got also people like showstoppers and Pepcom trying to do sort of, you know, virtual kind of press rooms and stuff like that. But you've now got marketing managers who have traditionally done a lot of this, you know, event based marketing, as well as their kind of normal, you know, PR and digital and stuff. But they're now sort of being forced into doing only digital marketing. And I do wonder whether, I mean, I know you're, you're obviously as one of the unique ones where you're really switched on, you kind of know about digital marketing, you know kind of how to, you know, develop those sorts of strategies. But do you think there's a bit of a skills gap potentially looming where, you know, marketing managers, you know, don't really know what they don't know about digital marketing and actually they're going to have to start funneling their, their funds into that. And actually where, you know, where do they start? I mean, do you think they've got the skills to do it in some cases? Yeah, huge, huge gap. And it's kind of good to say we, we, we kind of know what we're doing, but we kind of feel like we don't because we have lost. We, 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 our, our average customer base is probably late 40s, 50s, you know, they're, they're the, the affluent high fly enthusiasts. That's the majority of our customer base, our core customer base right now. Um, and these are trade show guys. These are people who rely on trade shows, um, customer experience shows. And that's where we get most of our... Um, initial buzz and excitement from our products so your team understand the way we work like that and that for me has always been it's one of the reasons we start talking to you guys because we have to get away from this i mean that wasn't foresight that was just as you know trying to move with, with the site with, with the times um i do feel there's a bit of a knowledge gap within our company on how we do that hence as you know leaning on you guys and, and looking at social and things more recently um it is going to be a big challenge because 
a lot of us don't know, you know, where our customers are and what their habits are. Um, and we rely on the trade shows or the immediate opportunity, which is with retailers and, and distributors. Now, I mean, it's a bit of a running joke within our company. Um, our chairman, um, Tony, uh, a guy out in China, a uh, Chinese guy, he, he, one of his um, little comments at the start was, internet is the future. I mean, it, we kind of knew what he meant. He was kind of saying that, you know, in his broken English, that, you know, we've got to take advantage of our online opportunities right now. He didn't break so eloquently. So when he told us the internet is the future, we were like, wow, <laughs> this guy knows, this guy knows. But, he, right. you know, <laughs> he's right. We, we, we had to change. So with that, we've had to start thinking, okay, we have this X amount of money put aside for trade shows this year. How can we effectively, we can't all put that straight into Facebook because we'd lose all the money. You know, that's not, not the way it's going to work. And convincing a lot of people internally that that isn't the way is also quite difficult because people do see it as fool's gold. You know, it, is, it does have to be a strategy and we have to think about how we're going to do it. So we, we've had to adapt to more of a mix. You know, we are still going to try and do trade shows where possible. Um, and we are still going to try and support those on, on a similar scale where possible. Um, but we do have to consider where the opportunities are and, and how we can make people see our products without it being on a, a trade show floor. And that is incredibly difficult. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time looking into that. You know, anytime there's a bit of um, a bit of a pop up online or a bit of, um, you know, something comes up on an email you know, about uh, digital marketing, CMO tips or things like that. I've, I've never read on this stuff before and a lot of it is crap, but I'm trying to open my mind and understand from a different perspective yeah. that we are locked in a digital world. Um, and how we make the best of it. So there's a huge skills gap within our, in, uh, our industry and our company. Um, I can't speak for others, but we are going to have to adapt really, really quickly. Yeah, and no, I agree. And um, I mean, what part of my part of the reasoning behind my question sometimes is, you know, I think some of the marketing managers, marketing directors are going to have to have a bit of a, you know, trust element with their partners because they're going to suggest things that they don't necessarily, they've not necessarily done before. They've not necessarily, they don't necessarily understand and, you know, they're just going to have to sort of go with it a bit and just sort of experiment with digital marketing a bit more because, like I said, they've not been trained up on some of this stuff. And a lot of the kind of higher, you know, the, the higher level digital marketing stuff, you know, you have to be a bit more of a, like almost like a data analyst to kind of understand it, um, you know, because there's yeah. some parts of my business which I don't understand what they're doing. You know, they're kind of spending and they're kind of monitoring and they're kind of, you know, adjusting spend based on where it's been successful and kind of in the sort of looking at the the analytics rather than actually, you know, I'm a kind of old school sort of PR creative person and I like the creative idea. And that to me is like doing, you know, come up with something cool. Let's get that message out there and let's really push it. But with the, you know, the new guys, you know, it's less about the creative and more about the targeting where they're kind of putting this message and, um, you know, and monitoring it. So it'd be interesting to see how it, how it evolves really. And, um, you know, whether once we kind of, let's say in a year's time and, you know, the world starts to get back to normal, whether people revert back to the original marketing plan or they kind of, you know, they do sort of, they have sort of changed, made changes that are going to continue, you know, for the long term. So, I mean, I actually think, you know, the best approach is going to be, you know, ultimately this sort of more of a hybrid approach where shows I think are still important. You still need that sort of face-to-face -face connection. You know, you, you like to know who you're doing business with and the shows sort of provide the foundation of that for, for all of us really. Um, but whether they invest so heavily in stands and kind of, you know, all the sort of traditional things out there like the sort of show stoppers and sponsoring the, the shows and all that kind of things that they would have spent a lot of money on normally you know, they can reuse that money for much more sort of targeted, effective marketing. And um, I think this might be the push for them to do it more, you know, as an ongoing thing. So, so where do you think um, the main respend will be then? And let's say, you know, you weren't spending, you know, half a million euros at a show, you know, where would, where would you, where, where would you bet your money on? Where would you put it? Um, well, it's, it's, we're going to have to rely on um, the voices within the industry more. I think influencers are going to become a lot more powerful. Um, whether that's established publications that have you know strong online presence within our industry, that would be the likes of um, what HiFi, for instance. Um, you know that they're, they're actively talking to our customers, and no doubt they've seen an increase in their traffic during these times because people look to them as a reference point. But we're going to have to maintain a bit of a mix. We are going to have to adapt. Um, and what I'm already trying to to think along and push out our resource creation team and our platform management team into is 
ensuring that we establish a new customer experience because I think trade shows are going to be for the, for the next 12 months at least they're going to be few or far between um, you know I can't imagine a major trade show anywhere in Europe in the next 12 months um, and what we don't want is because there's a danger that we could be offering the best product in the world but if the customer can't experience it in an adequate way they're not going to understand what we're trying to do so we have to think about how we introduce it and what we give the customer as that experience um you know it's going to be the same for estate agents or someone you know the house viewing is now going to be done more or less by video in a lot of cases so how do they enable the customer to get the best experience for that we have to think along a similar way so what resources do we put together does this include more detailed videos does this include you know third party contribution from the offer we looking towards advertorials and things like that are we you know are we looking to get things out for reviews and things a lot sooner with a lot more assets and you know creative insight and technical information on paper or in video or animation how do we change our experience and that's where we're going to have to look at how we focus our investments because we can't be pouring half a million euros into trade shows that you can't have people on your stand you know we're going to have to look differently and the main the most important thing is not allowing the customer to adopt a new lower standard of experience of the product which will ultimately mean they don't spend their money um so we, we've got to figure out how we do that yeah it's definitely tricky i mean it's particularly with your product range because it is a sort of you know experience type product i mean you know people do need to kind of experience it in order to see you know to feel the quality of it i mean so yeah no it's interesting i mean look, i mean you know we're all in the same position at the moment there's i'm definitely seeing lots of um you know interesting kind of virtual concepts being presented to us to kind of you know because it's making us as an agency look at you know how can we develop that sort of virtual offering more especially for brands like yours i mean there's um a company that we've come across that um they've actually got a warehouse where they've got a live a studio inside the warehouse so instead of kind of us doing for example you know a launch event in a you know like a bar or wherever we would have normally done it um, and invited people to that we can actually put the event in the studio still invite people in a virtual distancing kind of way and then bring the event to everybody virtually so they still we still in, enjoy the event but you know it's done in a way that you know, a way of the times, but, but again, still with, with products like yours, it's, that it's more of a branding thing than it is an experience thing because you can't, you can't, you know, bring your product to the, to someone's room virtually because you've got to sit and listen to it in its environment. So, um, yeah. so yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But, um, so look, Jamie, I am, um, you know, I know you're a busy guy. Um, you know, I just want to thank you for your time today. I think it's been really, I mean, sharing your views with um, with China as well. I think that's always insightful. It's, um, you know, it's one of those kind of challenges with the world, I think, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on there. But every time I sort of delve into China, I'm always impressed. And I always think that, um, you know, maybe in the Western world, there's sometimes a bit of a prejudice against China because of what the media puts out there. But actually, you know, it is an amazing place and it's a, it's an interesting place. And I find it very intriguing. Um, and I like it more each time I go. But um, but yeah, let's say thank you for your time and um, yeah, let's yeah, thank you. Yeah, have fun with the baby. I think it's going to be. Yeah. I was a. Uh, I've got obviously I'm ahead of you. I've got two young children. They're seven and eleven now. And um, you know, I always found it was that sort of year to two two years old period. Once they start moving, <laughs> that's when yeah. that's when things get interesting. So um, but I'll. Uh, I'll I'll check in on you in six months with that. <laughs> cool. All right, mate. Well, uh, yeah, let's speak soon and um, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, cool. Thank you.